All right, Steve, this Michigan uh, Revenge Tour, it's going along as planned and uh, not even getting any challenges to the Revenge Tour, which will, of course, uh, continue next weekend against uh, the Ohio State Buckeyes in Columbus. But for right now, it's a what's typically been a game bunch of Indiana Hoosiers. But uh, before we dive in on IU, uh, your update on your Michigan football team, there has to be nothing but uh, A's in all the uh, grade uh, categories. You know, I was really mystified. You and I talked about this in the off season, Mark. I was really mystified with the analysis. And, you know, I've been on here enough to know, I've been on here enough for you to know that, you know, if the team in the winged helmet, we're in the maize and blue, ain't doing it right. I will say so. Okay. But I was just mystified with this analysis that the, the number three overall defense in the country returning nine starters was going to bring in a five-star quarterback, and Michigan wasn't going to be any better. Do you remember us talking about that in July and August? It just yeah, absolutely made no sense to me. Like, and I said at the time, I get it if you're looking at the at the road schedule and you're like, I just think they can't win all those games. That's a perfectly reasonable analysis. But I watch people like Barrett Salee and Clay Travis and Paul Feinbaum and all these people just like. I, I get you know I work in the national media. We all have to play to our respective. Uh, audiences to some respect. I get that. But to to claim that, A, Shea Patterson was going to be Ole Miss's backup quarterback this year, hot damn, that's one hell of a football program they got right there if he's their backup quarterback, number one. Number two, that he was coming all the way up here to basically run fullback check down passes like John O'Corn last year. I, I just didn't get that analysis. So the level of dominance, I think, is surprising. But I you know, I don't know why anybody's really that surprised Don Brown has had the number three, number one, and number one defenses at Michigan. I don't know why anybody's that surprised adding a five-star quarterback to that defense and they're 10-1. and one. You may be surprised at how dominant they've looked at times, and I am as well. And I think a lot of that is a market cor correction. When you go back and watch that Michigan State game, we caught two balls. They're on deflected passes that should have been interceptions. And that's the kind of stuff where the universe corrects itself when you've had a lot of bad breaks go against you in recent years. You you just that stuff kind of starts regressing to the mean the other way. You know, I think the domination is a factor of the emotional edge of of you know and some extra motivation, some breaks in the past we maybe didn't get, for example, with a really good football team. But I don't know why anybody would, would be surprised by a team. I don't know if you saw Mill Kuyper's big board today, but I told you I thought we had any NFL prospects on our team is anybody other than Alabama. And if you look at his big board, it's, uh, it says that. I don't know why anybody shocked a team that talented with an upgrade at quarterback is 10-1. and one. That makes no sense to me. So the big question out there, Steve, is who can beat Alabama? And of course, 10-1 well, if they beat Indiana, I should say. Pardon me. If they beat Indiana. Yeah, yeah so the conventional wisdom goes to uh, Clemson and then Georgia, and then it's all over the place, but uh, headed up by Michigan, Oklahoma. Some people uh, believe because of just the change of pace and the offense is so overwhelming. Uh, the reason I bring that up is your detractors will say you're just a bit of a zooped up LSU. Okay. I, I, I don't, maybe I'm just older now. I don't buy into this. If you don't win the playoff, you had a, a crappy season. It's not the NFL. We don't have 32 teams. We have 130 teams. You know, I don't think Michigan State feels like their Big Ten title two years ago was tainted because they got, you know, uh, polaxed by Alabama in the, in the college football playoff. You know, so uh, still, uh, even if if we're not that good, then it's okay. If we win in the Big Ten championship, we haven't done that in 15 years, you know, and, and in an era of, of non-shared titles and only one team gets to win it. I, I really resent the notion, and I say this, you know, I'm to the right of Attila the Hun politically, Mark, as you know. I, I like meritocracies, okay? I don't like victimology, but I also think we need a little perspective. There, there's, a, there's, there's more going on in a college football season than just who wins the playoff. And, and uh, I, I think that there's a lot of things that you can accomplish, and if, it, if Michigan cannot compete with, a, with an, maybe the greatest program in the history of the sport, who has had you know a seven-year head start on recruiting can you know perennial number one classes next to Jim Harbaugh, and and might have um, you know an all-time generationally great quarterback. Okay, doesn't mean your season was crap. 
<laughs> so, I mean, so they may not be that. They may not be that good. I, I, I don't know. You know, if I, to me, I think if you're asking me on a national perspective, I, I think when Tua is healthy, Alabama's playing a different game than everybody else. All right. Now, what we have not seen with him, you know, this LSU defense is good, but it's not like kind of LSU defenses we're used to that gets a lot of pressure in the front. Their back seven is really good, but their front four is not nearly as good as it has been in many years. I do wonder, you go back to some of the two, two Tom Brady's, two Super Bowl losses to the Giants. What, what did those have in common? Justin Tuck, Michael Strahan, uh, Jason Pierre, Paul. The ability to get an organic pass rush with just the front four so you could cover with seven. LSU doesn't have that kind of front four. Clemson obviously does. And I think Notre Dame actually has that kind of front four. Michigan would be interesting because we don't really have a front four. You know, we blitz more than half the time, but the misperception about our team is that we do these house blitzes with zero coverage in the backfield. That's not true. Uh, you know, we put seven or eight guys in the box and only we usually will rush four or five. You just have to guess which of the four or five are coming. But we play coverage quite a bit. We don't just sit back there and put all these guys on islands up and down the field. That's a bit of a misnomer. And so, you know, I'd be fascinated to see Tua Tonga Bailoa's processing speed, which I think is, you know, a God-given level of elite you just don't typically see. Uh, to watch him try to figure out on the fly what Don Brown is doing, I think would be fascinating. I look at teams like Notre Dame and Clemson, who I think with traditional front fours that get you a pass rush, I think they have something that you don't see it too much in the SEC. Mississippi State has that, and and Alabama had their lowest point total of the season against them last week. But the problem we have with Alabama is now the defense is coming on. All right, so they were kind of young early in the year, and now all those guys are getting good. So you know, if you're not as good as as the all time arguably greatest program in the history of the sport, it doesn't mean you wasted your time for the last few months. You still had a pretty meaningful season. So I really resent this idea. This isn't the NFL. It's not the NHL. It's not Major League Baseball. We, we don't have 30 franchises or 32, 130 schools. And they, they could still accomplish quite a bit this year between rivalry games and conference titles. If you're not as good as Alabama, okay, you're not as good as Alabama. Steve Dace, Michigan Podcast. Absolutely. So let me extend your point, Steve, because it's easy to make that the bar, the gold standard for somebody else. Meaning if we held ourselves as, as people, as professionals in our own industries to that standard, basically right. what we right. see on, the, on social media all the time is basically if you're number two, and I hate seeing this term all the time, you're trash. You're garbage. Yeah. He's garbage. He's trash. Joe Flacco's trash. He's only the tenth best quarterback in the NFL. He's trash. They're trash. As you think Joe he's... Klatt is a good college football announcer, Mark? Think he's good? Yes, absolutely. Really good, right? Yeah. yeah. He, you know, um, he, what he gets in terms of viewership compared to uh, the number one star at your network, Kirk Herbstreit, nothing. So I guess Joe Klatt, man, should just retire. He should quit. He's so, trash. Um, I, I, yeah, I'm trash. I, I'm, I, don't, I don't have the following Kirk Herbstreit does uh, with a 20-year head start on my career on the number one sports network of all time. So there, there's no point in me going out here and calling any more of these games. I just I, – I, and I think I think ESPN and other networks are going to have to figure out – I heard Kirk Herbstreit talking about that this week on a, on, uh, a show on, on the first team on Sirius XM. He was talking to his ESPN peer, Greg McElroy, and he said, you know, we're going to have to figure out – as, as national media people, how to put the emphasis on the playoff where it belongs. But prioritizing the playoff is, is not the same as, uh, as, as making it the only show in town. And he's right. He's concerned. Like, if you're Ohio State, he said, and let's say you lose to Michigan and you're 10-2 and two, and you go to the Rose Bowl, that's a great season. But you go out there against Washington State with one loss and, you know, are you flat? Are you like, I don't want to be here? You know, we didn't make the playoffs, so what's the point? You know, and so I, I think that that's something that folks that do this in the national media are going to have to figure out what's the ratio between how much the playoff should get the should get primacy. I don't argue with that. It is it is the ultimate goal, you know, just like the Heisman Trophy is the ultimate individual trophy in our sport. But Mark, is it the only trophy? No, there's other great trophies. So should the Heisman race get more coverage than everything else? Yes. Should it be the only award race that gets covered? No. That's kind of what's happening right now. 
And I don't think it's, I don't think in the long run, it's really good for the sport because here's the difference. We've always had dynasties. It's always been a dynasty driven sport. I mean, my favorite team used to do the big two and little eight when I was a little kid, right? Dynasties have been good for college football, but they were good in the context of the regionalization of the sport. That even if Nebraska and Oklahoma dominated the Plains, it had no bearing on who won the SEC championship and got to go to the Sugar Bowl and have a great year, right? But now that you're going to have dynasties with a playoff, you threaten the regionalization aspect of the sport that makes it still so noteworthy, even if your team is not number one. Look at Washington State I just mentioned a minute ago. This might be Mike Leach's best coaching job yet. Bring in a Gardner Minshew with the porn stash in the middle of June and, and, and uh, as a cast off from East Carolina, and he was going to go to Alabama and be their third string quarterback. And you lose all those players on defense. Your defensive coordinator deserts you for Ohio State. You have a tragic suicide in January. And, and if they don't go to the playoff, but they win the Pac-12, does that diminish the season Washington State's had whatsoever? I don't think that it does. And that's not everybody deserves a trophy. They won a damn trophy. They, in my scenario, they won the league. We're acting like that doesn't matter anymore. And I don't think that's good for the future of the sport, frankly. Yeah, because again, we don't even have to conjecture about what Ohio State's going to fail to do this year. Just look at last year. What right. is the narrative for most fans, even inside, I was going to say outside of the Ohio State Nation, Buckeye Nation, but even inside Buckeye Nation is that the 55-31 or 55-24, they lost by 31 to Iowa. That's the score that sticks out. They were a failure. They missed the playoffs. They finished number five in the country. They beat USC right. by 17 points in the Cotton Bowl. They won the Big Ten Championship. Yeah. And it's a selection process, people. It's not uh, – it, it's a selection process. They could have been selected to play in the playoffs, but they See, just – That's didn't. the thing, too. The other sports that have this notion in the pro sports – you we they all know what the criteria is to play your way in, right? You can win it, you win your division in one way, you know what your record is, and then you know what all the tiebreakers are. That's why you watch teams in December in the NFL run up the score a little bit because they know that's one of the tiebreakers, right? You know there is an objective criteria that everybody knows. Whoever does the best job of meeting this criteria in all the major pro sports that have a true playoff gets in. We don't have that. We have a highly subjective process where each week the committee goes out there and says, well, for some teams like Alabama, it's about eye test. For other teams like LSU, LSU it's about resume. Well, Georgia, I, I could argue Georgia actually has a better resume than my favorite team, Michigan, okay? It, the whole thing is subjective. And so if we're going to have the, the worst thing to do is to, is to, is to, de, is to nationalize the sport with, with dynasties when it's completely subjective at the exact same time time. There's a reason why the pro sports leagues have expanded their playoffs in the last 20 years. They've added wild card rounds, things of that nature. Now, I'm not advocating that for college football. What I'm advocating is we just understand that there's there's other meaningful, not as meaningful, Alabama, whoever wins this thing on January the 10th, absolute, or 8th, I think it is, absolutely deserves the lion's share of the acclaim. But it doesn't mean the other 129 teams that played this past season didn't accomplish anything. And I think we're kind of heading down that road and I don't think it's good for the sport. God bless you, Steve days, because you just did what I try to do each and every day here practically and beat my head against the wall, trying to uh, get certain points across. And that being one, like I could take, and I think you'll understand my, my comparison here and my, my correlation as it is urban Meyer, Nick Saban, since urban Meyer has been at Ohio state, take out the postseason because neither one of them could completely control when or when they were not in the postseason. Just take the regular season. They, they basically have had the same stay at each school. The, the record's almost identical to a T. Now there have been certain breaks and bounces that led or selections that were made in Nick Saban's favor that afforded him the opportunities. All credit to Nick Saban in Alabama that they completed. They completed the run. When given the opportunity, they took advantage and ran with it and won the championship. And Ohio State did, and they didn't. But but they weren't afforded as many opportunities with almost exactly the same credentials in the regular season. Mm -hmm. and, and we don't have a committee deciding who makes the Major League Baseball playoffs. No. We don't have a committee deciding who makes the NFL playoffs. We have one in college basketball, but the argument in college basketball every year is who are teams 69, 70, 71, and 72, who we all know aren't going to win this anyway. We're arguing about who teams three, four, five, and six are. 
That's a far more divisive argument. And that's why I just think we need a little perspective. If you, you can have a meaningful season that matters greatly and not win the playoff or even get to the playoff. And I, I agree, the teams that win the playoff, because all the all the leagues agreed to these rules too at the same time, right? So everybody agreed these are the rules. So whoever wins the most by those rules deserves the lion's share of the acclaim. I don't debate that. I'm simply saying, though, there's other ways to have a meaningful and enjoyable football season than just doing that. That's all. Okay, Steve, I've got uh, Jeff Sheeran from Black and Gold uh, to talk uh, UCF with Cincinnati on deck, but uh, we, we brought you on here to talk uh, Michigan football. So give me your best synopsis on what are you just overjoyed, just can't get enough of out of this Michigan team that just has you just feeling so good about it? What maybe still is a concern heading toward Columbus in a couple of weeks and kind of your wrap up synopsis here? The biggest concern I have about heading into Columbus, I think Ohio State's defensive issues are going to take a year to fix. That, that They're just too young in the back seven, Mark. They're just too young. Uh, they've, had, they've had cluster early entries to the NFL draft in the secondary, and you're seeing that. And, and they took their best edge rusher, maybe the best edge rusher in all of college football, and he's gone. Now, offensively, though, with the weapons they have at the skill positions, they have a puncher's chance against anybody in the country. So my big fear next week is beautiful day in Columbus, and we just catch Dwayne Haskins on a day that he's dealing. That's my big fear. But the thing that I love about what this season has accomplished is Michigan came back ungimmicky, if that's even a word, meaning – this, if I would have said, hey, in year four, this is the brand of football that will be fully established at Michigan, you wouldn't have doubted that Jim Harbaugh did that. If I would have told you at the start of this year that they would have fully been able to establish this brand of football, you'd have been like, eh, I don't know they can get that all done in just one offseason. They finally look now. This looks like a model, especially with the way they're recruiting this incoming class and the one in 2020. They're this is now the program is established. I don't believe, you know, he's going to have a 79 and eight record or whatever Urban Meyer had at Ohio State because the league's just much tougher now. It just isn't going to happen. But we finally did establish the brand and identity of football that we thought we were going to see from Jim Harbaugh all along. And I think that this is not a fluke. I think you're going to pretty much see Michigan. It won't look this dominant all the time, but this is now finally the brand of football many people thought Jim was going to be able to establish here. It's now arrived. And there is something to the rivalry. Two different teams, to a certain extent, may show up on Saturday in two weeks. The one thing I will say is these people that say, it's a rivalry, throw out the records. I, that That's a bit far. When, when Ohio State was Ohio State in 2008 and 9, and Michigan was the Michigan that we had in 2008 and 9 and 10, right. what did right. we have? We had blowout games because the teams mm -hmm. weren't comparable. So you just don't this throw out the records. It doesn't matter. Uh, I don't completely go to that end of the spectrum, but it is a rivalry. And so we may have Ohio State at its best and Michigan may feel a little pressure. We do, we can't get into the hearts and minds of 18 to 22 year olds. All right, Steve, we appreciate it. And hopefully we can really break down the Buckeyes and the Wolverines uh, this time next week. All right. Thanks, Mark. Go Blue. Thanks so much, Steve.